Have you ever been guilty of procrastination? Now, for those who don't know big words like that, it means putting off something that probably needs to be done, you ought to do, but it's hard, or for some reason, you don't want to do it. Very easy to put those things off. And we might be surprised just how that kind of disposition of heart and action handicaps a lot of things. It does so in government, on the job, in school, in families, and certainly when it comes to the Lord's church. In Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11, we read this regarding evil people and punishment because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil now just think of how that would uh, change things when it comes to criminals in this country and they're being punished for the crimes they've been charged with because they are truly guilty. But if you can postpone and postpone and postpone and postpone, it begins to build up a sense in the evil-minded person, because that's the kind of person that does an evil work, that they think they can get by with it. And so they aren't too much moved be that concern. Now, for those of us who love the truth and want to live according to the truth, and I mean the truth of God's word concerning righteous living, then we may not understand how people can get their minds in that state because the faithful child of God is constantly striving to do what's right as the Bible defines the right. Every day is that way with that person. But there are multitudes of people that don't have that disposition of heart. There are many crooks, thieves, burglars. When they got up this morning, they did not have any planned, some may have, but many did not have any planned store to rob or house to rob or break into or whatever. But they're dishonest and they're creatures of opportunity and they don't mind taking your property or somebody else's, so if they're going down the road and pop, an opportunity to take what does not belong to them comes along, they take it and go. Because a lot of the times they're going to get by with you. They're going to get by with you. So it's important when it comes to whether it's corrective discipline in the family, the church, or the nation, the school, that there be speedy execution of corrective discipline whatever the crime calls for. Psalm 10 and verse 6 ties in with Ecclesiastes 8, 11. He said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. Can people reach that stage in their thinking? Oh, yes, they can. They can never be moved. They don't think it'll ever happen. That's some that's going to happen to other people but not me the great prophet Isaiah 700 years before Christ walked this earth Isaiah 52 and verse 12 speaking to corrupt Israel said of their thinking come they say let us get wine and let us drink heavily a strong drink and tomorrow will be like today only more so well, think of how many years ago that was that people were thinking that way and the nature of man hasn't changed. Thus, there are people that can reach the stage. It's not going to be different tomorrow than it is today. And whatever comes uh, to happen to some, it's not going to happen to me. That's all for you, but not for me. And when we come to Luke chapter 12 in the New Testament, verses 19 and 20, we have... The rich, foolish farmer 
who had such a bountiful season. He said, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall all these things be? which thou hast provided. Then Peter, as with a verse I quote many times, causes us to think how some people think or see how they think. It's 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Concerning the promised return of Christ, we learn that the Lord hasn't come back even to this day and It'll be that the case until he decides to come back because he's giving people a chance to use time to repent of their sins. So the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, so men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And yet while he waits and while his long suffering is extended to us, the Bible is replete with material that says sinful men must meet the consequences of their sinful lives. It happened when sin was originally committed by Adam and Eve in the garden. They immediately were separated from God. Their bodies began to die, and they were kicked out of the garden because the garden was meant for sin sinless people. The whole world felt the impact of sin when People developed on the earth, grew in number. Their mind was only on evil continually, and God said, I'll destroy them off the face of the earth. And so he did, Genesis 6 and 7 of the great Noahic flood. We see Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of the plain. We see God using Israel and destroying the Canaanites on the land, what we now know as Israel. And so we go. Why are those things in your Old Testament since we're under the authority of Christ in the words of the New Testament? Here's exactly why. God keeps his promises. If you disobey him, you must suffer the consequences. If you love and obey him, the promises of blessings are yours. You go through the Old Testament, Time and time again, I said I would destroy them if they didn't do thus and so or they did do thus and so, which is ever the case it is, sins of omission or commission. And the question we ask, did it follow through with Adam and Eve, what he said would happen when they ate of the, f the fruit of the forbidden tree? Yes. What happened when it came to the world of Noah's day? What happened when he came to Sodom and Gomorrah? And so on down the line. God keeps his promises. Whether it's to the wicked, they'll die. There'll be punishment. There's no way to transgress God's law and not be punished by it. People don't seem to understand that. You can have a little baby that's crawling and it gets a hold of some sort of wire or whatever that'll conduct electricity. And being the baby that it is and what babies do, it crawls over and sticks it into an outlet, electrical outlet. Because it's a baby and innocent, will it not be shocked? Or worse than that? On the other hand, here's a master electrician and he makes a mistake and touches something he shouldn't. That does happen. The law of electricity says it's not going to make a bit of difference. It's going to shock him just like the baby. And so it is when it comes to spiritual matters where we violate God's law and we sin, we'll suffer from it. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't get forgiveness. That's not the point. Well, why have a statement like this made in the Old Testament to young people? 
Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the days draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. What is being said there? It's just as true today as it was then, and will be to the end of time. Mold your life around doing from the heart God's will always. And you won't get yourself into some of the messes that a lot of folks do. Because you'll be programmed by the truth, by a God who loves you, and you'll have heaven's blessings behind you. It's interesting, as we pursue this further, to realize then that once we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can fall away. Remember how many times we've pointed out in the right division of the word of God that most of the New Testament is written to members of the church. They heard the same gospel that anybody does today if they become a Christian, and they did. They, believe, they had believed in Christ, repented of their sins, they had confessed their faith in Christ as the Son of God, and they were baptized for the remission of their sins by the authority of Christ. When you read the letter to the Ephesians or to the Colossians or the churches of Galatia, they had all heard that gospel believed in Christ and obeyed the gospel. Yet so those letters in most of the New Testament are written to keep people faithful in the church. And that very matter points out that once you become a saved person, you can fall away from the faith. So I'd like to study just for a little while based upon what we said about a certain church member who forsook the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I say a church member who forsook the truth of the gospel. You know who it is already if you're familiar with the New Testament because the great apostle Paul mentions Demas. And you know he only mentions him three times. A few words, but three times. Yet in this small space, we see a once faithful Christian who fell away from the truth. First of all, notice in chapter 4 and verse 14 of Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. As he's mentioning people who are with him and working with him. He mentions Luke, the beloved physician. And he says, and Demas greet you we go further and we're able to emphasize this point Demas is in the greetings of Paul to the church at Colossae along with the others who are with him but then we come to Philemon 24 learn a little more about Demas and him being with Paul what he was doing with Paul you find Paul saying, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, my fellow laborers. So I know they were working with Paul in the spread and defense of the gospel. So we have more insight into what Demas may have been doing during the same time period. How would you like to be labeled, and correctly so, a fellow worker? With Paul, well, of course, today, if you love the truth and live it as a faithful Christian, you are a fellow worker with Paul and every other faithful child of God. Demas is mentioned along with two inspired penmen here and another faithful Christian, as previously mentioned. You have Luke and Mark and Aristarchus. Well, Demas is in good company. No problem with the kind of encouragement and example he's going to get from these godly brethren. He was with them and worked with them daily. But then we come to the third mentioning of him, and that's Paul to the young preacher Timothy. In 2 Timothy 4.10, he says, For Demas hath forsaken me. And he tells us why, having loved this present world, this present age, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Then he mentions that Crescens to Galatia. 
Titus, another young preacher, to Dalmatia. Well, if we didn't have 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, we would be left to think Demas ended his life faithful servant of God. But when you take all of what the Bible says about Demas, we see that's just not the case. He sadly ended up being the thorny soil described by Jesus in John, or rather Matthew 13 and verse 12. He let the affairs of this present world as thorns grow up, crowd out his love for the truth. Paul says that he went to Thessalonica. He's a human being, so he thinks like every one of us. He's motivated by the same thing we are. Maybe he started thinking about his home. Things had to do a red house. Things that he couldn't do while he was where he was. Maybe he thought, well, I need to be doing secular work. Maybe, maybe he missed that and maybe he missed the pleasantries that come from being with friends and family. And when you take those things and contrast them with the persecutions that accompanied Paul, and he's there, a fellow laborer with Paul, um, that was quite a bit of difference in the life that he could have and what he had. Oftentimes we might say, oh, I'd love to travel with Paul. You sure? You sure that uh, you wouldn't be a demon? What kind of faith in God through the Word of God do you really have? You don't know sometimes until you put the test. And we can boast great things. Remember the Apostle Peter syndrome? <laughs> Although they all, they all leave you, I won't. Yet when he was put to the test, he found out his faith was not nearly what he thought it was and he boasted about. So whatever the reasons, they all added up causing Demas to decide that those things were more important, whatever they were, was of this present age than spreading and defending the gospel of Jesus Christ and suffering with the Apostle Paul. The life of Demas provides us some very stern warnings. First of all, leaving Christ is a gradual thing. A person is not a stalwart, faithful, dedicated, steadfast soldier of the cross of Christ, active in every good thing that God would have a member of his church to be involved. It comes about gradually. I think we can safely say that the apostasy of Demas was not immediate. In other words, we're saying you're not faithful to God one day and the next day you're unfaithful. He had to go through some sort of process of thinking to lead him away from being with Paul and doing that work. Even as he had to undergo some process of thinking to decide to be a part of that work. And I do know from Paul's dealing with Mark that first of all, he wasn't apt to take somebody he didn't think would stick with him through thick and thin because he didn't want to take Mark on the second missionary journey because he'd left him on the first. He wanted somebody to count on. So by the very fact Demas was with him, said he must have thought he could count on him, he could depend upon him to stick with them as they underwent all the things they had to in the persecution for preaching the truth. So it started with a single desire to be somewhere else. Have you ever been in a position where you say, oh, we'll show somewhere else in here? Or maybe it was to be something different. Maybe you wanted to have fun. I don't know what people think along those lines. I do know the right of Hebrews talks about enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. So there's pleasure in sin. How would Satan get you to transgress God's law if it didn't appeal to your fleshly desires and make you happy and all that? 
So for this reason, we must pay much closer attention. I'm using terminology of the book of Hebrews now. Lest after we've heard, we let those things slip by drifting away. Hebrews 2 verse 1. So apostasy is gradual. The first step away from the truth is the step on which all other departures of the truth is built. And thus, whatever chink we see in our armor, no matter in human judgment how little it may be, that's just the way that <coughs> Satan gets through the armor to where he can take our spiritual lives. There's always something trying to capture our attention. <clears throat> you should one day just say, I'm going to write down everything that comes across my sight today, my ears today, that's designed to get my attention. And I don't know how much you'd write down. You might not do anything, but you surely couldn't drive somewhere because everything where you look is designed to get your attention. You'd have to have somebody driving you so you could look at everything that's designed to get your attention. And my, if you think about television, internet, Everybody all around you, all the stuff that's designed to say, here I am and usually buy me. And when you buy me, though you spend money, but when you buy me, you'll save money. And I always wait, except the money it took for me to buy you. <laughs> it's always something like that, but it's not so bad to try to get people, if you're in business, to buy whatever tool you have. If you really believe it's worthwhile, people have to have things to live by. But I'm talking about things that are designed to get your attention to lead you away from the most important thing in your life, and that is living like the New Testament says. There has to be some resolve on your part that says, yes, that appeals to me, but I haven't got time for that. I'm too busy serving Christ in whatever particulars that might be. So there are many things in this world that are contending for uh, the top list and our priority list. And you know who knows that? better than we though it shouldn't be that way and that's the devil himself I promise you he knows full well we cannot serve God in riches Luke 16 13 and he's going to do all this with his power and how powerful he is to get us to put God in second place God will not take second place nobody's going to heaven that puts God in second place nobody Though working and taking care of our homes, which involves our families, we have to put God first. I know better how to love my wife because I studied the Bible. And so it is with a wife toward a husband and parents toward children and children toward one another and their parents. If they'll listen to God, who created us? God. Who created uh, marriage in the home for the good of man? God. Who tells us to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? God. Who says, I will call all accountable people into judgment before the judgment seat of Christ when this life is over and the world's done? God. Sounds like we ought to listen to him with the intent to obey him. In Colossians 1, verse 18, Paul wrote to the church concerning Christ, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now watch. That in all things he might have the preeminence. In other words, he must come first. Colossians 1, 18 ties in with exactly Matthew 6, 33. But then you have John writing to Christians in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Here's how you do that. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world. Now, who's, let's pause here. Who's this written to? People outside the church? 
No, he's writing to Christians who've heard, believed, and from the heart obeyed the gospel. They've been added to the church themselves. Why does he write that to them? Because we can be like Demas and love this present world and depart from Christ because of it. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride or vainglory of life is not of the Father but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Again, 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. Well, then I understand what he means when he says, no, love not the world. He means letting the appetites that are peculiar to the flesh and the affairs of this present age take our time up. Let them become preeminent in what we're doing. And we're right back to this wonderful statement of Matthew 6 and verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's an amazing statement. But when we talked about Christ, the great physician, this morning, and we think about God and how much he loved us, that he gave his only begotten son for us, then he can provide for us. We talk about the providence of God. That means God provides for us. He promises us. Jesus makes us a promise. You put me first in thought, word, and action, and I'll take care of you. Now, please understand, that does not mean everything I want. He's going to give me. Because Americans don't know the difference, for the most part, in what I want and what I need. But he does promise you the needs will be taken care of. And we most time at that point say, I just don't see how that works. He didn't ask you to see how it works. He'll take care of it. Think about it for a moment. If your children, as they're small, you expect them to trust you just like God expects you and us to trust him. We're his children. Imagine your child at five years old saying, Daddy, Where's my food coming from this week? Where's my clothes coming from this week? Where's the house going? Is the house still going to be here next week? And on and on you could go. Lord took such simple things and said, here's what it's like. And thus, brothers and sisters in the family of God are told, just do what I say always, and I'll take care of it. You parents and those of us who have our children already grown and gone, or they seem to be, <laughs> do you want them to have the trust in you that you will take care of them? That is, as the Bible says, your responsibility is to take care of them. A man doesn't provide for his own, he's worse than infidel. That's pretty good incentive for the faithful child of God to stay faithful and do what God told him to when it comes to being the husband and father he ought to be. You realize what all that would do for this country if husbands and wives just had that attitude about them, themselves and their family? It's such a simple thing, yet it's such an integral, important matter. It's not being done. There are children who get up every morning, they don't know, I'll close with this little story. I may have related it to you. When I worked at Charlie's Children's Home, I had to be at work at 8, and I was usually the first one there as far as the offices are concerned. And I'd open the door and get everything set up, and everybody would come in right afterwards. Well, I got there one morning. I, they opened at 8, and I got there one morning, and I pulled up in the parking lot, and there was a little boy, I suppose, 6, 7, 8 years old. I'm guessing he may have roughly that. don't remember nowadays. And he was sitting on the steps of the administration building, just sitting there. Well, I knew he didn't belong in the home. I didn't recognize him. And he had the most sad, downcast face. So I walked up to him and said, how are you doing? He looked at that me and he was just like this. Mister, what must I do to get in here? Now, why would a child of that age, with parents being what the Bible says they ought to be, which they weren't, why would a child that age 
have that burden on him. And that's what's happening throughout America. Only now those kids have grown up and they've got kids of their own. And if this child lived, he's been an adult for many years now. We in the church are a light into the world, not only in being at the worship as God commands, not only in our individual lives on the job of being exemplary and living the Christian life, but being the homes God expects us to be and just doing what parents are expected to do in rearing their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, when we think we can violate all these things and we can be derelict in our duties and slow to act, and well, you know, tomorrow's coming. I'll take care of it then. Remember that procrastination? It won't work because someday that day will not come. I love to preach. It's never been a get up and go to work job where I've got to go to make a living and I don't like it. Now there's been parts of it like any job <laughs> you wouldn't like. I don't think Paul necessarily liked being pummeled with rocks or run out of town. But keeping in mind what we've said concerning where our eternal reward is in heaven, and loving to preach the truth, teach the truth, then as a teenager, this was the best way I saw that I could save myself because I'd read where Paul told Timothy, if I'll teach other people the truth, I'll save myself and them to hear me. I still believe that. It put me in a position to where I was being forced to study for myself, not only for my own good, but to teach others, to refute error, to lead them along. Now, was I perfect at it? No, and I'm not today. And that's been, what, 58 years ago since I started preaching. And I don't think I'm saying something that's just peculiar to me. I think that's true of any faithful preacher of the gospel or any elder or deacon or any truly faithful member of the church as the Bible defines it. We're here for such a brief period and it gets shorter day by day and we don't know when we're leaving. But it's like Peter said, said, while I'm still with you, I have this obligation to continue to teach. We should all feel that way with one another. Paul would say, my departure's at hand. That's how he viewed dying. My departure. We talk about departures out here at the airport or somewhere like that. Going from one city to another or to another country. Well, when we leave this world, if we've been faithful, we're just leaving one place and state of being and going to another place and state of being. And Paul said to depart and be with Christ. It's far better. So every day we live, this is the way it ought to be. And if it's the right thing to do, just get up and do it. <laughs> now, it may not be that other people you try to help are going to take the help, but you've done your part. That's the point. And are we doing our part? And let's not be procrastinators. And let's realize that we can fall away, but when it comes, it gradually comes. And let's realize why Demas is recorded in the scriptures and why we should take a note and a lesson from it. If you're not a child of God, we've studied already the plan of salvation. If you want to become a Christian, this is the only way to do it. If there's a child of God, you've sinned. We've studied what to do about that, to repent from the heart, confess your sins, and pray for forgiveness. We now have now. We, it's hard for us to realize things can be existing in a complete other way, so radically different from life in the flesh on earth and in another place. But it's going to happen. You realize... Since we met this morning to now, do you stop and think how many thousands have stepped out of this life into the other, in the other world? The sad part about it is they're accountable to God. Most of them left unprepared. And it'll be that our turn. We're in a long, as they say in England, we're in a long queue. And it'll be our turn before long to take that step over into eternity. If you need to obey the gospel, why put it off? Why not do it now? All together we stand and while we sing.